Hello and welcome to Lettres d'Amérique, a virtual series featuring essential American literary voices. I'm Alice McCrum, Programs Manager at the American Library in Paris. Bonjour et bienvenue à Lettres d'Amérique, une série virtuelle avec les nouvelles voix de la littérature américaine. Je suis Alice McCrum, responsable des programmes à la Bibliothèque américaine de Paris. So, um, tonight I do have the pleasure of hosting Jenny Zhang in conversation with Roberto Rodriguez Estrada to, to discuss um, Jenny's new collection of poetry, My Baby First Birthday. Roberto Rodriguez Estrada is a poet and writer from California. They are currently completing an MFA in fiction from the University of Virginia, where they are a poet, uh, a Poe Faulkner Fellow rather, um, they are at work on a novel and a collection of poems also. Zhang was born in Shanghai. Jenny Zhang was born in Shanghai and grew up in New York. An author, poet and essayist, her work has been published in the New York Times, BuzzFeed and Rookie, among others. A graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop and Stanford University, Zhang has also written for television and TV. She lives in New York City, where she is working on a novel and a screenplay. So now over to Jenny and Roberto. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us at Lettres d'Amérique this evening. We are absolutely delighted to have you. It's so fun to be here in the conversation again. Um, we've had the privilege of talking before, so I'll um, hopefully be asking some fresh questions also about my baby first birthday and also it's um, kind of connection to your work in general because they're all kind of you know, in, in conversation with each other. I'm excited to be chatting with you. Um, well, I guess to start, uh, I think one of the core parts of the book is this sort of engagement, aesthetic engagement with blather and baby talk. So the word um, goo goo comes up really frequently, which is, um, you know, in um, I guess in American English, it's what, what um, babies are supposed to say. They say like goo goo gaga is kind of the first sounds that they make. Um, but yeah, how did, and, and I guess in the poems they give this impression of a, a, a sometimes immature and sometimes childlike speaker. But can you, can you tell us a little bit about what goo goo is and, and how it became the sort of a center of the, lex, the book's lexicon? <laughs> yeah, um, that's a good question. I'm gonna try to answer it the best I can. It's been a while since I've thought about um, this book and these poems, but you know, goo goo is always <laughs> foremost in my in my head. Um, I think, you know, I was interested in. Um, I was interested in the idea of um, when you really want to express yourself, but you haven't yet learned like the legible language of society. <laughs> um, and I was really interested in, uh, this is really hard. I think I was interested in the idea of Goo Goo um, because, you know, when I was five years old, I immigrated from Shanghai to New York and I was a really, really verbal child. Uh, like I could speak um, when I was like nine months old and I could sing like songs when I was like 10 months old and I was always telling stories. And I think, you know, from a young age, I felt very like special and adored for my ability to speak and entertain with speaking. And so it was sort of like an identity shock an existential identity um, shock and wipeout when I moved to another country and lost essentially like the first thing that formed my conscious identity. <laughs> and I think like it sounds a little bit uh, 
ridiculous this idea that I would have like an existential crisis when I was five years old but like I did because of the circumstances of my life and suddenly I had no way of communicating um and I couldn't like communicate to others who I was beginning to think I was at this very like young formative age and I just remember really really wanting to speak and picking up like books and read in English and reading them out loud to people, but I didn't know English. So I was just kind of like blathering and, and speaking in like a total glossolalia and a kind of, I guess, like goo goo language when, when I was no longer an infant. Um, and I think it just became this metaphor for like, there are always times in a person's life beyond our literal babyhood where we're like wiped of words to communicate to others, but that doesn't stop us from wanting to communicate and connect. And uh, I just also like the way it sounded and it's a very soothing sound. And I also feel like sometimes even when we can speak the language that everyone understands, people don't understand us anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's like, I always say like, even just the words like, how are you? Or thank you can be understood in like a million different ways from menacing to wonderful. And so I think it just, sometimes I just used it as like a stand-in for um I don't know just the way in which like language is like the most amazing thing and the most like stupid thing that's like ever existed <laughs> I don't know I think that's my answer <laughs> yeah well I think there's also a way that the poems are really um I mean they're super playful in a way that they uh they're like the speakers are like making fun of themselves and are making fun of other people um at culture and at um the political landscape and i mean that kind of gets me this question about you know I, a motherhood as another thing that the that the poems are interrogating and um the speaker and there's a poem called um the universal energy is about to intervene in your life and the speaker says um there are too many centuries of mothers loving their mothers i will be the first to love myself more than i love my mother um so what kind of launched in that it's well it's also interesting because you're kind of drawing threads between motherhood and infancy and um and femininity and how they're all kind of inextricable in some ways. Um, what kind of, what, uh, what launched that, that interrogation for you? Um, yeah, that's such a good question, Roberto. Um, well, I mean, motherhood is like, I think the most, <laughs> It's something that like is both like deified and worshiped and also like, I don't know, like can be something that is like reviled and insulted like so much. And, but it's, I, I think of, I mean, how do I say this? Um, the sort of ideal of being a mother or someone who mothers is like the ultimate nurturer and the ultimate life giver. So without mothers, there would be no life of human life, right? Or, or not even human life. All, all creatures have to be mothered to come into the world. Um, and that's a very, that's a very, that's a very uh, lofty task <laughs> for an individual. Um, and also um, there's all these sort of like 
societal expectations of motherhood as like the ultimate sacrifice you know you sacrifice your body you sacrifice um in some cases like your own hopes and dreams um there's that there's that expectation that's also very intense but also you know mothering is like in many i would say I don't like this word, but I'm going to use it because I can't think of a better one. Like marginalized communities, mothering, it doesn't mean like a cis heterosexual woman who birthed a child through her like vagina. <laughs> um, it, it also just means like a way of like caring for someone and helping someone get through the world that doesn't involve like a biological birth necessarily. Um, and also we have to mother ourselves. A lot of people don't grow up with uh, quote unquote, a mother or, and I don't, I mean that in the broadest sense. I, I, I mean, mothering is like this idea of like someone who helps you like come into the world and, and survive until you're ready to do it alone. Um, and sometimes we don't have that or the people who are supposed to be our mothers are unfit or, or they never had a mother and they have to deal with their stuff. And, and so also we all have to like mother ourselves and give us like that. Uh, I was reading this, sorry, I'm just all over the place today, but I was reading, uh, I love self-help books. They're so soothing to me. <laughs> And I was reading this one self-help book and um, I'm going to botch this because I'm, I'm clearly not a studied person in psychology, but it was about this idea of like a background object that when you're a child, um, one of the most stabilizing and comforting things is when you're playing and you just know that in the background, like your mom is there and she's not gonna go away or if she does, she always comes back in a way that is like predictable and you don't like need her to be like holding you, but she's there. And, um, and people who grew up with that in like a consistent way, kind of like grow up to be sort of like pretty well adjusted and, and secure because there is not like an extreme neediness, nor nor is there an extreme dismissiveness of other people's presence. Mm -hmm. And of course, all of this is also vastly unfair. Why should it only be, you know, biological mothers or or people who are um, identified as uh, women or whatever who have to do this? Um, that's a whole other topic. But anyway, it just made me think like, okay, wow that would have been amazing <laughs> to know what that's like and what would be the conditions that would have happened in my family lineage in terms of stability and safety and, 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 res and access to resources to have gotten to the point where I could have had like such a childhood or something and it's not about like blaming anyone or um you know wanting to go back and undo everything but it's just a really it was a really like interesting idea and it made me think like well uh you i don't know it just it was just this thought that i uh had recently about um about the like platonic ideal of motherhood I'm really going all over the place now and not answering your question but so, um, <laughs> I think to the in, an, in a different kind of vein there's also the whole strand I, there's a whole strand in there um, and um you're hearing the French <laughs> Okay, I think maybe it's not okay. Um, there's a whole kind of th uh, another through thread or through thought or whatever that's going through the book is um, the sort of the ways that friends are able to take care of each other or hold each other 
um, in a way that's different from the kind of family structure. Mm. Um, and then, and so you, I mean, you dedicate the book to your friends and the friend, your friends appear in the, as poems or, you know, there's like, um, they have their own sort of mini poems that read almost like text messages, um, mm -hmm. but they are kind of these loving and encouraging um, notes or sort of thoughts. Um, and it, it kind of gives the impression that there's some sort of like political or ethical project there. Mm -hmm. So what, um, can you talk a little bit about writing collaboratively with friends and and or even I'm um, like I've heard that you were in a sort of long-term writing group um yeah yeah um yes I, I I've been in a writing group that I started when I was 19 with a bunch of writers from my university and it's 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 I think it's still we're still going pretty strong uh like 15 years later um, I guess I'm going to try to connect it to all your other really great questions, um, trying to bring the spiral back, but, you know, I think, um, something that is a disappointment and a struggle that these poems try to like reconcile and think about is that we don't really have control over our surroundings and what happens to us when we're born and when we're babies we don't we don't even have control over being born someone did it and then we're here <laughs> and you know i i think the poems are very grateful for life but they're also very upset at the idea of being born um i guess you could say non-consensually and um and born into, you know, um, lineages of violence or pain or struggle, and also born into a world that is not always like nurturing and um, and soft. Mm -hmm. um, but there is something about friendship that involves like deep volition and deep choice, and 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 is a different form of relating from that's very consensual about friendship at, at its highest ideal. And, um, and there's something ideally very like non-hierarchical about friendship. Um, and so I found friendship to be like a very healing thing and a very, uh, like a, a form of like a healing lyric in uh, poetry. And um, yeah, I think, the idea of like, well, if you didn't get the kind of, if you didn't get to be innocent as a child, if you didn't get to be nurtured and mothered the way you wanted to be, then how, how, how do you do that as you get older? You know, when people are like, you have to love yourself before you can love anyone else. I was always like, but how do you love yourself? <laughs> like, what are the actual, like, step-by-step -step things that I would do or someone would do if they didn't like receive like an education on what love was. And um, and one of the things I realized is like through the mirror of friendship is you can see the way a friend looks at you and sees you as this sort of like wonderful mirror um, to like see yourself in a way that maybe had always been distorted. So that became something that was just fun. And then on like another level, um, I just found it fun to, I find it really fun to text friends. I don't know if you like have, uh, you know, I'm sure you have lots of text threads and group threads going, um, on your phone. Um, and you know, I have this like theory that, uh, poetry became like more accessible to people once um, text messaging became a big thing. Cause it's one of the only mediums, only writing mediums we have where it's okay not to have perfect grammar. It's okay to make up words. Um, if you're not one of those people who writes in full paragraphs, um, which I guess means you're 
probably under the age of 40, uh, <laughs> then there are natural line breaks in the way that you text and there are stutters in the conversation. Sometimes you're responding to a text that's eight lines above while also responding to a text that's one line above. So it's not like a linear um, narrative. And just like the way like everyone knows what like a linear plot narrative is because we all watch TV and we're all exposed to that all the time. Now we're also exposed to like the poetic project of like lyricism and line breaks and making up shit and juxtaposition and um, all of that stuff. And so it just became fun for like, I would screenshot my text messages with friends and sometimes I'd look at it and be like, well, that's a poem, you know, like those, it was like, that was a stanza or that was like a couplet or a tercet or whatever. So it became a really like fun way of writing for me. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, it literally became a lyric. <laughs> yeah, um, I, there's also the kind of um, on a monopoetic, uh, Thing in your poems where you'll have, which I do all the, it'll be um, kind of like, you'll, ex, uh, when you hold down the you and like you, <laughs> or like, um, or like yay, and you're, so your, your speakers are like, it's like an ecstatic <laughs> form as well, I guess, both texting and, and your poems in particular, because you don't really, I, f I feel like I haven't really seen other writers really do this that much um, or other poets do this as much. It's like, well, what you said, it's like, you know, when someone says something absolutely outrageous in a text message and you're like, no, with like eight O's. <laughs> I, I, I think that's cool. I just like anything that, um, you know, encourages like playfulness rather than like, uh, a slavish adherence to what has already existed. <laughs> yeah. um, can you talk more about play? Um, the So the poet Ariana Rhines um, in her blurb for the book compared it to um, Pantagruel and Gargantua or Gargantua and Pantagruel by Rabelais. And um, she is and it's because that book is so full of um, human drives, but also through there's like gnomes and, and beasts and um, it's very vulgar. Or there's like a uh, kind of, there's there's almost an uh, echoing vulgarity um, in that book and in, in your poems um, here, but it has to do more with kind of like rages and appetites and longing and, and ecstasy um, and, and your poems take that to like this, a similar mythological and sensual place. Like um, there's a farting queen <laughs> and, the, and there's like pubic hairs kind of covering a speaker like blankets, um, which belong to, you know, the beloved. Um, so yeah, can you talk about play um, both in your life and, and, and your writing process and childhood and all that? Yeah. Um... And Ariana Rhines is an incredible poet, as is Roberto, which everyone should get to know their work. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I can, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I can, uh, I, I definitely cannot speak to uh, her ex 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 extremely like excessive and generous um, reference to Rabelais, but yeah, I think, um, you know, the ecstatic and the euphoric is another um, poetic. It, it's one of the forms and modes that poetry does best um, because the ecstatic, I mean, all extreme emotional states are, can feel like flashes and fragments and, uh, and, and, and lack the sort of like linear logic that of storytelling that we sometimes want to put on our lives and so it's a natural like mode for for poetry that I've always enjoyed and um you know I did uh grow up reading a lot of uh, like French poets who indulged in um ecstatic profanity and vulgarity and excess and um 
that paid you know great amount of attention to the body. Um, I also just think the body goes through so much and I try to be, I don't think I'm using this word right, but I, I use it because other people have said it. So I'm just copying them. But sometimes people say like that these poems are very embodied and I don't really know what that means. But to me, I just think like when I write, it's not abstract. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not just ideas. I am thinking about the actual body and the body is something like our bodies go through so much. They're capable of so much. There's so much stuff that's like happening. Um, and it feels like it's all happening sometimes in, in our head, but it's actually also happening in our bodies. So I think um, it was my way of paying tribute to all the things that go in our bodies and all the things that come out of our bodies. And um, I don't feel like there is anything to be ashamed of when it comes to the body. And yet it is the most shamed thing I can think of, um, especially for certain bodies that don't, I don't know, that, yeah. So I think that was something I wanted to like speak to in these poems. It's really funny talking with you, Verto, because as you probably know, sometimes writing a poem feels a little unconscious and, and, uh, and then later, like sometimes years later, I'm like, oh, that was what that was about. So it's, it's sometimes I feel not like a fraud, but like, I'm like, I'm saying stuff and is it true? I, I'm not sure, <laughs> but yeah. I'm trying to be truthful here. <laughs> On the, um, that we were talking about sort of the, the body um, having, it's, there's a lot that's, not consensual about the things that our bodies do but then there's also like the non-consent as you were saying about um the about there's like a, a violence of of the gaze that's non-consensual of certain people direct or the gaze of certain people's gaze is directed towards um you know for instance you have the poem that's like my the slant or like my whole body is a it's like you're, it's talking your about body is slanted. your whole body is slanted. Your yeah. Whole body is slanted and, and it's talking about like a, a, speak, a speaker being asked, like, is it true? Like Asian women's vaginas are, are like slanted or whatever. Yeah. Uh, sideways pussies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, which, you know, it's, I, the, I think a lot of the poems are concerned with power, um, and you know, the bringing life into the world is a certain kind of power. Um, and and uh, there are all there are these poems about like the environment um, and and the wealthy and uh, and and victims and and victimizers, but also how a speaker and the poems can sometimes identify as both at the same time, mm -hmm. and it was in a way kind of troubling um, mm -hmm. that dichotomy. That's so smart because, you know, I hadn't thought of it that way, but I mean, every single person right now is grappling with anyone who wants to have like, to bring like life into the world. And this is not even true now. This is true for all of human existence. You always have to grapple with the fact that you want to bring life into a world that's not yet safe that might be dying, that might be violently dying. <laughs> that is a world that is full of violation and abuse on a macro and micro scale. And yet I completely understand why knowing that intellectually doesn't, like I understand also why someone would, would wanna bring life into the world in, in that same way that like, I, I was upset. There are times when I'm upset that I've ever, that I was ever born, but there's also so many times where I wouldn't have had it any other way. Like I got to experience this life and I'm so grateful. And that is like a dichotomy that 
you know, exists in these poems, or it's not a dichotomy, it's a duality that these poems try to reconcile with. And even the most powerless people are still capable of uh, hurting another person. And that's another, um, I guess, like, dichotomy duality that uh, these poems were really concerned with. Maybe I should read, I'll read one poem. It's just, it's like, uh, there's a lot of poems in here called My Baby First Birthday. Um, I, it's not gonna be translated, I'm sorry to the um, French listening audience, but uh, uh, just kind of <laughs> take it in, I guess. Um, I, I think I was supposed to tell you what this poem is about a little bit, but I have a really hard time <laughs> saying what something is about. Sometimes I don't know. So I'm just going to read it and hopefully uh, it'll be enjoyable. This is called My Baby First Birthday. My mother had two vaginas, one to birth me and one to keep me. Inside the first one, I had two names, my given name and my other given name. My twat had a name too. It was forgotten because the climate changed. The climate changed because of God, obviously. We as a society stop naming our twats. The old ways make way for some way of being again in this world where we bury the old inside their baby bodies. This way, when we wake up from our dead sleep, we shall be little bright stars, dead to the world and dead to the love our teeny tiny gods created. Their cunts hugging so tenderly at the moment of creation that I think this world was truly made for us. Still, we won't live forever. We won't know how to tell the others who will have surely lived like we lived inside the total darkness of their mothers too where it doesn't matter what we know and what we do not. Uh, yeah, that's it. And um, I'm not gonna say anything else about it. <laughs> Maybe I can say a few things about it. That made me, um, I remember reading that um, when it came out and I think it came out in like Poetry Magazine or something. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I remember reading it and being kind of like, um, the way that it made sense to me was I was, I've always, you know, when you're the child of um, of immigrants and you have sort of one foot always in the motherland and kind of one foot in America um, and you aren't quite at home in either. So I always thought about, I thought about it as my like shadow self or like the self that I would have had um, if, you know, I'd grown up in the motherland or whatever, and and who would I who would I have been, mm. um, and and would I still be on the on the same kind of path? I love that. Yeah, I think that's amazing. It's also like just this larger question of who would any of us have been without trauma. But like all humans encounter loss, abandonment, mm -hmm. disappointment, trauma, violence to different degrees, you, you can't get through a human lifetime, um, uh, you know, unless you were to die immediately, I suppose. But even just being born, right, is an abandonment because you go from being like safe inside the mother's womb, um, to like kicked out <laughs> and like the like I don't know it's like it, it I'm not I hope that's not too dramatic I mean it happens to everyone but like that's a pretty harsh leaving of one world for another <laughs> um and so that's all with with within us and it's also like hearing what you were saying Roberto um this is like the corny thing I'm going to say but it's also like who would we all be if we were like really accountable to each other's well-being and, and lives and, and really cared mm -hmm. about like creating a, a, a world that was based on like nurturance and care rather than like extraction and, and taking. It's like, that's a huge dream, obviously, but also why shouldn't we have this huge yeah. dream? 
And I think, you know, I, I was just thinking about, um, there's another poem called Under the Chiming Bell, yeah. um, which I really relate to because, you know, when you were, you are kind of, it's, the speaker is kind of mulling over the fact that um, she could have been, she's at an artist residency <laughs> and it's like a really fancy, um, beautiful uh, place in the middle of nowhere and, um, and uh, surrounded by quiet, it's quiet and, and um, there's like, a, it's bucolic, um, but the speaker is kind of like, I could have been a servant um, here, or I could have been, um, or my mother, you know, could have been a servant here and, and do I belong here and where do, who am I, where, where do I belong in the ways that um, as writers who happen to be also um, not white or necessarily privileged or, or wealthy or having like had all the resources given to us, it's kind of a, um, it scrambles your mind a little bit to be invited <laughs> to be in those spaces and totally. to that world. Totally, and as everyone knows, or maybe not everyone knows this, but everyone I know seems to know this, but um, just uh, if, if you've experienced one way of being treated for a long time, you also sadly deputize yourself after a while to treat yourself that way. So like if there's some feeling of being lesser than that, was instrumental in one's life. Um, the saddest thing is like, we become like these little like evil foot soldiers for like reinforcing that feeling. And so when we are suddenly, um, when something good happens to us, quote unquote good, it's very like cognitively distorting. And I think success is something the process just as failure is um and because it 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 just having something good happened happening to you doesn't change like a lifetime's work of like who you have been and that's kind of a disappointing thing but it's also a real thing and um and i think i think uh, maybe, you know, to close things out, I think that's why I was I, into this idea of being a baby, because I was into this idea of like, rather than chasing some kind of, I think it's very seductive to be like, if this happens to me, all my problems will go away. Mm -hmm. And I think at least for for me that's a thought that I've often had it's it's never worked obviously uh, you know I've gotten the thing and then none of my problems went away but sometimes what it takes is to like sometimes I think I wonder like what would it take actually not for all my problems to go away but to get to a point where I feel I feel like innocent again and I feel like a baby again and I feel like I can try in the most innocent and pure way again I think sometimes that is not an answer to all the problems but it's like a beginning that kind of works yeah that reminds me of um like this mode theme of touching in your poems too which is it, that kind of circles back also to what we were talking about the the embodied, the so-called embodied poetics thing. Yeah. It's, I think more of it is that they, the poems like want, the speakers want to touch and be touched. And you're, you say, um, actually, I, I remember where I read this, it was in your, you had a chapbook essay called Hags, where you talk about your mom calling your poems touchable. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, there's a this desire to to um, you know come into contact in a way that is is not a violation and that mm -hmm. is consensual and that is um, like nurturing and and caring. Totally. I mean, all I I think I think everyone wants to be touched in like a safe and loving. 
way. It's really interesting with, um, I mean, not interesting is the wrong word. It's really sad with COVID and the pandemic. Like there were people who didn't experience touch for like the last 18 months. And that was really, really hard on people. <laughs> like it really sucks. And uh, there were, I remember like the first time I hugged someone, you know, after like eight months of like not hugging anyone, it was like an overwhelming experience. It was like, I felt like I was having like a hallucinogenic drug trip of like, it was, it was like a holy experience. And um, yeah, it's, it's such a simple thing, but it, it, it can, yeah, but it, it's such a simple thing, but you can't take it for granted. Now I feel like I'm trying to be a self-help um, author instead of a poet. <laughs> Should, yeah. Um, Roberta, thank you so much for asking me these like amazing questions and uh, bringing like your insight into my poetry. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today and uh, we'll bring Alice back. Thanks. Hello, Thanks. hello. Thank you so much, Roberto. Yes, oh, you've already disappeared. <laughs> So, so easy to appear and disappear. Um, yeah, to echo Jenny, thank you for your wonderful questions and all of the time you spent um, coming up with them and, and the thought and care you put into them. Um, and we'll bring you back at the end and, and thank you again. And uh, so we are now moving on to the Q&A section of the evening. Um, if you joined a bit late, uh, you have stumbled in on a conversation between um, Jenny Zhang and Roberto Rodriguez Estrada, uh, a conversation about Jenny's new collection of poetry, My Baby First Birthday. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, um, sure. And uh, so I'll be now reading your questions in the chat and kind of bringing out themes that you want to hear Jenny talk about. So um, Audrey has a question. Um, hello, Audrey, who's tuning in from Paris, near the American Library in Paris in the seventh. Um, she wants to know, what role do you think literature might play in nurturing readers and communities? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, from Audrey, is that right? Yeah. Um, thanks, Audrey. Um, well, you know, I can only say for me as a child, um, books definitely nurtured and mothered me. I learned like from some books I learned like how to be a person and how not to be a person. From some books, I got to have conversations that other adults didn't wanna have with me or I couldn't find adults to have with me that I desperately needed to have. Some books were just fun and I just needed to have fun and I didn't have a way of doing that in my like physical realm. Um, you know, sometimes I just want to read like a, a YA romance book. Sometimes I want to read like, uh, you know, like a fantasy book about like elves <laughs> because um, cause, like humans are difficult <laughs> to deal with. Sometimes I want to read a book that like facilitates a big cathartic cry like so um I think there is a place for all kinds of literature um I, I don't know that's uh I, I think I, I don't know like where my writing fits into that maybe someone could tell me <laughs> yeah I mean do you think about literature kind of in relationship to your readers and the communities that are reading your work I think I try only in the sense of I try to make it pleasurable because I know sometimes um like I I'm not always if if I were not me if I were some reader I would not always be in the mood to read me because sometimes uh like my poetry or my fiction like sometimes it deals with like difficult topics and and I'm not always in the mood for that but I think what I try to do is uh, you know, as we were talking about with Roberto, I try to infuse a sense of play. I tried to, I tried to put little jokes in there. I tried to make it funny because I still want it to be enjoyable, even if uh, the topics are sort of difficult sometimes. So 
that's probably as far as I try to think about. I try not to think too much about audience um, because uh, it it uh, I, I don't want to overestimate how important I am. And sometimes thinking about audience can do that. Mm. Yeah, I think to the point of um, of play and 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 humor. I, I love this quote from the interview you did with the press. Where you said, "Having a sense of humor is really important to me." Uh, a few lines later, you said, "People don't find me funny at all, and that really sucks for them." <laughs> yeah, you, is that the case? Or does some does, is your humor lost on some people? I think some people are like annoyed by me, and they think like, "The hell is wrong with her?" and I'm just like shocked every time. I'm like, I'm I'm so hilarious and entertaining. How could you, how could you possibly not be entertained by me? Um, but you know, I don't know. You know, there are people who are very think that they're very funny, and I'm repulsed by them. And so I can only say that usually when we're repulsed by someone, it's a reflection of what we think our values are and I'm sure there are people who think that my values suck and so they're never going to find me funny <laughs> um fantastic that's great um I, I suppose I know I wanted to ask you about this too so let's start with Betsy's question and then um I might weave in one of my own um Betsy asks could you please talk about how you revise your poems and how that process is different or similar to your fiction revision revision process Betsy, who's watching uh, from Saint Germain en Laye, and uh, and then she they have another question, but that's the first one. Oh, hi, hi, Betsy. Betsy is a uh, awesome writer and former student of mine. Um, so yes, um, with fiction, it takes me longer to write it in the first place. Um, so it's just kind of a longer process and. Uh, I think with fiction, there are in the in the revision process, there are things I have to think about that I don't have to think about as much with poetry, which is like, does this make sense? Are there plot holes? Um, is is uh, is the action clear? There's kind of more technical, I would say, not fun things to think about with fiction um, because just creating a story that makes sense, I find sometimes difficult. Um, so obviously that's not always something I have to think about with poetry. Um, with poetry, the revision usually happens on a sort of like purely um, language level because the kind of poems I'm writing usually capture a kind of feeling and I don't wanna revise feelings. <laughs> I want to keep it as like a little monument to that moment. Um, but what I often do, and this goes back to the conversation I had with Roberto, is um, you know, I'll 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 wonder like if a word needs to be swapped for a different word or um if, if very, very minute things like that. And I'll send like different examples of, of lines, like three versions of a line to four or five friends. And then we'll have this like cool conversation where someone's like, yes, when you use the past tense, it makes me think that you're like, you know, creating this feeling of like referring to a fossilized emotion rather than like an emotion, like, like rather than a, you know, active emotion and like, or they'll be like, oh, when you, when you type O exclamation mark, it looks kind of like uh, you're making fun of old poems, but when you type O-H, exclamation mark, you seem more sincere. And so I love those kinds of conversations where we're talking about at the word level. And actually, if you think about it, it's not that different from like, if you're texting someone and you're anxious, but you're like, what does it mean that he wrote no, period? Um, you know, like we do it all the time with text messaging and why not, you know, and I think text messaging is a corollary to poetry. So that's kind of what I do when I revise poetry is I enlist my friends. It's like the group chat where you're trying to get people to help you encode. What did they really mean when they sent me this? <laughs> and, but it said, it's like, what did I really mean when I was trying to write this? <laughs> well, if this is interesting, if text messaging is the corollary to poetry of the 21st century, I mean, what was it before, do you think? 
Oh God, I don't know. I think before it was probably like, there was, you know, obviously a bigger connection between the, the, the song lyric, the, the musical lyric and the poetic lyric. Um, and uh, I, 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 I don't know, I imagine that the corollary before was some totally horny night, like singing music and stroking his like lute to some sexy little maiden up there. I, I don't know, this is my fantasy, <laughs> but uh, between that era and- Yeah, exactly, you know, between, the 14th, between the 14th century. <laughs> the I have no idea what happened in the intervening centuries. <laughs> enlightenment all of that uh, um that's your second question and um audrey also wanted to know uh what self-help books have you been reading oh some classic ones this is i guess not quite a self-help book but i think it falls into the category um you know that book uh the body keeps the score unfortunately the person who wrote it turns out i think uh he's been accused of um all kinds of terrible things um so it's a bit soured for me but it's a really good book um in terms of just information and then uh there's another book i don't remember the name but it's a book about abandonment and i wish i could remember the name um just google the most famous book on abandonment and i think it'll come up <laughs> um great betsy says thank you so much uh and on that note so emma wants to know um so self-help books from self-help books to music and movies have you been have it been inspiring you lately yes um let me think. And indeed, um, literature. I mean, really, what, what has been inspiring you lately? Yeah, um, I have been enjoying um, uh, oh my god, her name just like oh, Chantal Ackerman films. Her name just like slipped out of my head. Um, oh, just, you, and you mentioned this in, in this in the past review interview that you're you were a fan of, of uh, Letters from Home or Notes from Home. Oh my home. God, yes. Yeah. Is yeah. it called Letters from Home or News from Home? News from Home. News from yes, home. I, I always say Letters from Home as well. No, I, you're totally right, it's News from Home. And can you just <laughs> explain to people who haven't seen that, you know, what is it about and how does how do you think it relates to your poetry, your work? It's such a good movie and I know. Um, of course, Chantal Ackerman is an iconic, um, uh, you know, filmmaker, rest in peace. Um, it's like set in the 70s and it's mostly just shots of New York in the 70s, a lot of them from um, like the inside of a moving vehicle. So you see these rolling um, kind of slow shots. So I think I just loved seeing, I, I always just love seeing New York um, in older eras. Um, and over these shots, and some of them are in the subway, some of them are walking shots. Um, um, but over these, you, you hear, um, I believe it's Chant Chantal herself reading letters that her mom sent her when she I think was in her early 20s and living in New York. Um, so you just only hear these letters from her mom and they, you know, some of them, they start off very like, you know, I love you. This is what's happening at home. So-and-so is getting married, but you can tell as we go on that there are like these long periods of time where Chantal's not responding to her mom and she's probably depressed and hiding. And you'll get these, you know, increasingly agitated letters from her mom being like, why do you never tell me how you're doing? Like, I worry about you. And then you'll, then it's like, you don't, you, you never hear the response letters from Chantel, but you can kind of um, infer because then the next letter from the mom will be like, I'm so happy. Like you responded. I'm just so happy that you're like, well, and um, it becomes this sort of I don't know how to explain it, but this kind of like wonderful, it's just a wonderful feeling. And I think I'm also just really enjoying subtitles on movies because I know people sometimes like can't stand it, but it, it feels like I'm reading a poem actually because I'm reading these subtitles across um, the screen, but then there's also these images and it feels like 
a visual poem because there's these juxtaposition, these, these two seemingly disparate things juxtaposed with each other. Um, and also, you know, all poems are kind of pitched to a beloved and sometimes the beloved cooperates and sometimes the beloved is absent or uncooperative. And so I think it also felt kind of like a classic poem in, in that way. So I recommend everyone watch it if they haven't seen it or watch it again, it's so good. I think I'll watch it again. So which other, uh, which other Ackerman have you been watching or have you just been re-watching these from home? Um, well, I've watched uh, Jean Delmon, which I know everyone, it, it's a classic and I love that. And um, I have been reading <laughs> about, um, other movies I was reading about the last movie which I'm like preparing myself to watch sometimes I have to get into the, the mood mm -hmm. um I also really like this Thai director I'm gonna totally fuck up his name I think it's his name is Achi 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 Pat Pong where that's so cool I completely said it wrong but uh he made um Uncle Boon Me and um Syndromes and a Century and that's really amazing there's this uh Filipino director Love Diaz who is I think uh, uh often called the father of the slow cinema movement and uh I watched a five hour 45 minute movie that was like the last movie I watched in the theater before the pandemic and yeah. it was called uh, Bud Tong West Side, I think. Mm -hmm. That was an incredible movie. Um, and I really like um, Corrieta. Uh, he made a bunch of movies, including Nobody Knows and Shoplifters. And uh, he does some really cool stuff with like children, child actors mm -hmm. that I think is really cool. And then the last person I'll say uh, is um, I really love. Um, uh, Oh my God, I'm forgetting the name of this director. I'll come back to it, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. And I just want to thank, um, I'm not sure which interpreter is doing a fantastic job of, of keeping track of these people and putting them in the chat. So if you want to follow up on any of the recommendations, it's all been written in the chat by either Valentina Marguerite. Um, so thank you. Jenny, the last question I'll ask you this evening, because um, I am looking at the time is, so what are you working on now? And um, what are you looking forward to kind of this fall and into the winter? Cool. And the director I forgot was Abbas Karastami. Oh, um, right. Of yeah. course. Have you seen Close Up? Yes, I love Close that's, Up. That's probably one of my favorite films. So yeah. good. Yeah. And where, Where's the Friend's House, which is one in a trilogy yeah. of um, yeah. films is also really amazing. Um, right now I've been working on... Um, uh reading self-help books <laughs> i'm not even kidding um no actually i i haven't been doing that in a while and i actually need to again because it's so soothing mm. um i've been kind of working a little bit on a novel I, I started it before the pandemic so it's a little bit strange to get back into it because it's a little bit like I, I feel like there's like the stake down the middle of like before pandemic and after pandemic, you know, B, P, A, P. I mean, we're not after it, we're, uh, we're in it still. Um, but uh, that, that, that is going and some short stories. I've been into writing short stories. I've been into like writing poems um, just for fun on my iPhone sometimes, um, like on my notes app. Uh, every time I publish a book, which has you know only happened a few times, but um, I published my baby first birthday last May. And after it came out, I was like, oh, I'll never write poetry again. Like I've retired and the Michael Jordan of poetry, <laughs> JK. Um, and then I think I have to say that so that it takes the pressure off. And then once the pressure is off, I want to do it again. So I've been writing poetry as well. And uh, I'm working on some screenplays as well, um, just for fun. <laughs> really busy, lots of things, <laughs> which is to say yeah. many different mediums, many different projects. Fantastic. Lots of things in, in progress, yes. <laughs>
Cool. Um, and in addition to all of your recommendations, I've just posted uh, the links to, well, my baby first birthday, which is available in America. So here it is again, uh, mm -hmm. not yet translated into French and not yet available in France. But what is available in France, which I post the link to, is your book, um, Apre Coeur, So Sour Heart, um, which is an enormous success, you know, in America and in France. And so you can pick up that. I just posted the link.